Thank you very much. And my talk today is on the joint report of the Committee on Toxicity and the Committee on Carcinogenicity on the synthesis and integration of epidemiology, epidemiological and toxicological evidence. Um, just at the start, I would really like to thank um, Professor Alan Booth, who co-authored the presentation with me and also was our chair of our working group, and would like to thank um, Dr. Philip A. Botham, who kindly provided me with his slides that are the basis for this afternoon's presentation. Um, there we go. Just to give you a little bit of a background, um, the UK Scientific Advisory Committees provide independent advice to the government agencies, uh, departments and agencies, and in addition to the Committee on Toxicity and the Committee of Carcinogenicity, we also have the Committee on Mutagenicity. In 2008, COT and CSC published a joint report on synthesizing epidemiological evidence. Following the publication in 2019, the committees recognized the need for parallel guidance on synthesizing toxicological evidence, but also the integration of different evidence streams, and established the working group, or established the synthesis and integration of epidemiological and toxicological evidence subgroup, or short SETI. The objectives of the working group were to review the guidance on assessing epidemiological and toxicological evidence, but also to review the recent practices and frameworks on, census, uh, on combining epidemiological and toxicological evidence and combining other evidence streams. The aim thereby was to develop pragmatic guidance on how the different evidence streams should be combined in a transparent manner, giving appropriate weight to all. And the focus thereby was to integrate evidence to conclude on the plausibility or causality of an effect. This is just a really brief list of recent approaches on data integration. Um, I'm pretty sure you're aware with all of these. It's not an exclusive list. Um, there is a lot of other um, publications out there as well. This is a brief overview of the SETI approach. It has three main parts, starting with the problem formulation, then the information retrieval, which includes information retrieval on epidemiology, toxicology, but also areas of exposure and mode of action and other mechanistic data. And then the last but not least part is the evidence integration. And in the following slides, I'll go into a little bit more detail about those three different areas. So the working group um, basically considered the scope and problem formulation as the first step, but also the most important step. Having a clearly defined scope and problem formulation ensures that the right questions are being asked, such as why is an assessment actually needed, the populations of concerns, or rather, are there any population of concern and which ones are these, questions around exposure pathways and sources, but also whether or not a qualitative or a quantitative conclusion is required. Doing so ensures that the resources are most efficiently used and also the right scientific approaches are applied. And scope and problem formulation, at least for us in the UK, is usually developed by risk managers, but hopefully in conjunction or mostly in conjunction with risk assessors and committees. Doing so ensures that the output at the end, the assessment, is useful for our risk managers and allows for them to make regulatory decisions. The second part is the guidance focus on literature retrieval. And thereby, the urgency of the request often influences the level of literature retrieval or information retrieval that is um, possible. So whether or not, for example, a systematic review is actually possible. In cases of urgent assessments or urgent requests, that is not always the case. Um, but also questions around, has another authority published a um, sort of assessment recently, or have they published an assessment, and how recent is that assessment? And can it be used as a starting point rather than having to go back all the way through the literature? And then also what sort of information is being sought. Is it on a specific question or is it a general assessment of a new compound or sort of an update of an assessment? And then the third part that the guidance goes into is the evidence integration. So is there robust evidence that an effect occurs in animals and humans? And if there is an effect in animals and humans, is it a similar effect across both? So how strong really is the epidemiological evidence that there is an adverse effect in humans? But also, if there is an effect seen in animals, how likely, is that that, how likely is it that that effect is relevant to humans? And then questions around exposure, especially from animal data and when animals have been exposed to a high level, a high dose, is that actually a dosing that is realistically achievable in the common or in the human population? And if possible, is there sufficient evidence from other evidence streams for establishing a mode of action, key events, adverse, outpa outworth, adverse outcome pathways? Apologies. <laughs> um, the working group identified a visualization as a key additional step. 
Having a visualization encourages and assists discussion and final discussion, or assists the discussion of the final conclusion. We have started taking SETI through our committees, and um, one of the feedback we got that was, um, while well, the committee's reached a conclusion, putting it down on a graph, and I'll get to that in a second, um, kind of started the discussion again because having a look at the different influences of the different streams of evidence sort of started it all again because it didn't quite look the way they thought it would. Um, but having visualization allows for a clear depiction of the influence of the different evidence streams on the conclusion, but also it allows for clear communication of that in conclusion to a wider audience and whether or not a relationship or a causal relationship is more or less likely. It reflects and communicates the outcome of a deliberative weight of evidence approach taking into account all the uncertainties in the assessment. And the visualization should always be accompanied by a transparent narrative. Um, the working groups use the tabular form, but whatever form you would like to choose to use, um, it should be a transparent narrative, sort of like giving the underlying considerations and deliberations of the scientific expert and the expert's judgment. So this is what we proposed um, this could look like. It is adapted from Adami et al. And please note, it is a purely pictorial representation. It is not meant to be probabilistic or numerical. The idea is to start in the middle and then depending on the support of the evidence to sort of move the positioning on the graph either in the positive or the negative direction. And the sort of movement of that direction will be influenced by several factors. For example, the um, strength and weakness in the evidence, the, mo the weight of evidence, as well as the uncertainties in the evidence. So in the second half of my talk, um, I will give you a few examples of what that could look like. Um, please note, we did not in this working group take these three ch chemicals you will see in a second through the whole process. Instead, we used COT assessments and assessments by other authorities um, as a starting point, used their conclusions and their sort of assessments to just make a really pictorial example of what that could look like. Um, so the first one I want to go through is caffeine and its potential um, effect on um, development or its devental, potential developmental toxicity. Overall, the conclusion from the evidence is relative, well, inconclusive. <laughs> um, so while there is an effect in animals seen basically a decrease in um, birth weight, that is always accompanied with maternal toxicity. So it is not clear from the data whether or not it's a direct influence on the fetus or if it is a secondary maternal effect. There is evidence in the human data that um, ca caffeine affects um, fetal growth restriction or decreases, increases, increases, apology, um, fetal growth restriction. However, there is uncertainties over the exposure and there is no mechanism or no mechanism could be identified for the effect on fetal growth restriction. So this is what the working group um, produced. Yeah, you can see it um, proposed what this could look like. As you can see, there is some epidemiology data um, that gives an, an indication of effect. So it has been moved into the positive direction while the experimental data has been moved into the negative direction. And where these two intersect, that's the um, conclusion and causality. So in this case, a causal relationship between caffeine intake and an increase in fetal growth restriction is possible, but it lacks the experimental support. So the next example is a little bit clearer. Um, tropin and alkaloid and its potential neurotoxicity. There is evidence for a causal effect of tropin alkaloid. There's, from the Annabelle data, we know there is a clear anticholeric effect and um, from the human data or in observational cl and clinical studies, they do show an effect of tropin alkaloid on the neurological system. There are uncertainties in the data over exposure, um, mainly around um, a lot of the epidemiology, the exposure is done by self-reporting. So in this case, um, we're unsure or it is unclear what kind of tropin alkaloids actually are present in the food. And then, as you will be all well aware, I'm sure, um, there is a clear mechanistic understanding of the effect of tropin alkaloid. We all know it and antagonistically binds up to the receptors. So this is what the working group proposed it could look like on a graph, as you can see, for both animal and um, epidemiological data, it has been moved in the positive and where it like intersects, you can see it sits nicely uh, in the uh, likely or possible section a causal relationship between tropin alkaloids, in this case, hyoscyamine slash atropine and um, scopolamine, and anticholergic effects is probably likely from dietary sources. 
So the last example is cadmium and its potential effect on, or rather I should say its effect on kidney. <laughs> um, there's strong evidence from all three evidence streams that um, cadmium has an effect on kidney. The target organ is well defined uh, in animals. We all know it is the kidney from animal studies. And that is, um, it supports and is consistent with um, findings in humans where a range of studies or epidemiological studies have shown effects on kidneys of cadmium. And the mode of action of cadmium is well understood. So this is what it looks like. And we have tried to put all three evidence streams onto the graph. Ideally, I think this should be three dimensional. We have not worked out a way to do that yet. So if you have any ideas, we're all ears. Um, but as you can see, even clearer as for tropin alkaloids, um, the placement on the graph has been moved very far into the positive and we have included the mode of action. And as you can see where the evidence streams intersect, um, it is almost certain that there is a causal relationship between cadmium and their effect or kidney toxicity, renal toxicity. And that is further supported by the mode of action and the link to human data. So just to conclude, um, the components of the SETI guidance are not new, and neither were they meant to be. The idea was really to put down on paper the current practices of the committees and how we do risk assessments in the UK SACS. Um, and to put that down on paper in a transparent way so that it is clearly, so that somebody else can clearly follow how we do our risk assessments. Um, the idea is that like, um, oh yeah, sorry, um, and thereby give away uh, emphasis on weight of evidence and evidence integration. Um, the working group further suggested to use visualization as a way of helping communicate to the wider audience, on the one hand, what the um, causal or what the conclusion is, but also how the different lines of evidence influence that conclusion. The guidance should contribute to the consistency, transparency, and communication of the work of the committees. And the hope is that it is not just used for, for UK SACs, but could have a wider applicability, for example, in regulatory decision making. Should you be interested in the underlying considerations and deliberations of the working group, the SETI report is published on the COT and COC websites. So um, if you want some light reading, it is shorter than some other opinions. It's only about 30 or 40 pages. <laughs> um, but of particular interest to you might be Annex 1. Annex 1 is published separately, but also in the full report. It is a sort of more practical guidance of how we propose to do this with um, for each of the steps and areas, sort of a range of considerations and questions to consider. Um, all of our papers are accompanied also by a lay summary, and I am currently working on a peer review publication. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge all the members of the working group who have contributed to the work I've just presented to you. Thank you very much, and happy for any questions. Thank you.